Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hey everybody, sorry for joining a couple minutes late. I had some internet issues for a minute this morning. Um, how's everybody feeling? Can you all hear me? Yeah, feeling right, pretty cool. good. <laughs> Great. Everyone just settling into the new normal, which is 2020. Um, I have just updated the agenda. So I believe we have everything we need to get started. Um, if you're not on the attendees list yet, 
please feel free to send a late pull request. I'll I'll try to do a couple reloads and catch any that come in late. But always good to make sure that that attendee list is accurate to whoever's here. Um, all right, let's kick things off. So at the top, per, as per usual, a reminder that by joining us here, we all agree to the spec membership agreement, participation guidelines and code of conduct. Hopefully that's no news to everybody, but um, yep, those links are there in case you want a reminder. Let's do a quick around the room, put names to faces. I think we have mostly just returning folks here, but always good to have a reminder for anyone who might be new. Um, we'll start at the top and work down the order in the doc. And uh, anyone else who um, hasn't had their name on the doc yet can just hop in last. So everybody, I'm Lee. Uh, I think Andy said that he was not going to be able to make it today. So we can skip over him and then go to Yvonne. Hi, my name is Yvonne. And I hope to maintain GraphQL.js reference implementation and express GraphQL some other open source projects. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Benji. Uh, I work on the Graphile projects and I'm also currently contributing to the input unions um, and some other general spec uh, maintenance work. Rob, uh, working on the defer in stream spec. Uh, Liliana with first dibs, also working on the defer in stream spec. Hi, uh, I'm Jesse. I work at Apollo on Apollo server and Apollo gateway. I don't see Michael on here, so I'll go. Uh, I'm Matt. I work at Facebook on the GraphQL client. Hey, it's Morris at IBM working on a GraphQL proxy. Um, Hello, I'm Steven and I, I work on uh, GraphQL infrastructure at Netflix. Uh, hi, I'm Tejas. I work at uh, DGraph. Um, yeah, sorry, I just sent a PR with my name on the agenda. Uh, hi, I'm Evan. I work on APIs at Shopify. Uh, I'm going to be in and out today, but I'll try and uh, pay attention to the parts that uh, are mine on the agenda. Did we miss anybody? Jason, were you here? I just got in. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Jason. Uh, I work on the Nexus framework and, at Prisma. Awesome. Um, all right. I, I know I added a notes link late, but do we have some notes volunteers? I see some action already happening in there, which is amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm happy. Thanks, Benji. Um, you're a treasure. Okay, let's take a quick look over our agenda and make sure that everything that's on here is stuff that we actually want to talk about today. We're not missing anything. We will take a quick look over the previous action items. I don't know if we actually translated last meeting's notes to action items yet. Um, we will talk about require argument uniqueness, moving the deprecated directive on input fields RFC to a higher stage, uh, we'll get an update on defer and stream, and then talk about custom scalar PR. Anything else that you all would like to talk about today? All right. With that, let's take a quick look at action items and see what is still open. And I think I might also pull up last meeting's notes um, and just search through that live and speak through it live because I don't see issues created from the June meeting. Although we do have notes from the June meeting, which is great. 
Um, well, first, let's just look through the issues that are open, because there's still a handful that are open from the previous meeting. Um, still open are custom scalar spec editorial pass before merging. Uh, that is still on me. I will get to that um, very soon. I hope to get to that over the long weekend, actually. Introspection shortcut RFC. Um, that was uh, a takeaway from uh, discussing a stage zero RFC. So it looks like there's actually some activity there, which is great. You can take a look. Cool, just looks like it got an assignee a couple of weeks ago, but not much action beyond that. Update the input union RFCs after the handful of subcommittee meetings. I think that's still on um, the handful of us who've been working on that to get those updates in. And uh, which includes the ones above are just more details of that. And then include the first stream problem statements in the RFC doc. Oh, I closed that last time, that one's closed. Uh, and then let's take a look at actions from last time. I have a feeling that most of these are gonna be still open. <laughs> uh, we had an action to schedule a call about GraphQL scalers, we did that. Uh, we can give an update on that later today, even though Andy is not here, I can represent that. Um, there was an action to move forward the GraphQL namespaces with a, an actual stage zero spec. Uh, I don't think any action has happened on that yet, but that's on Courtney. And then there's another piece that was related to input unions, which I think we already mentioned that we didn't see a lot of action on in the last month. Um, that's okay, but we need to draft up a, an RFC that captures the tag types. Uh, just to chime in on that point, um, Lee, I have actually written the beginnings of the actual spec edits for the Ooh. RFC there, um, but I haven't managed to write the various fluff around it so that people know what the hell it is I'm doing. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that is in progress, uh, but I've been particularly busy. Um, yeah, I, well, I appreciate the update. That's great progress is is excellent. Um, I'll take a note to uh, make sure I get these previous meetings actions translated into issues so we can track them a little bit easier. And then um, Benji, if you have any of that to share, our work in progress, always great. I'm happy to um, give any input that's useful. Uh, and it can just kind of wait there until you get all the fluff around it. Thanks. <laughs> but I, I appreciate your hard work. I know everybody's been pretty busy lately. Okay, let's move on to argument uniqueness. Yvonne, do you wanna take it away? Yes, so I, it's a quick issue. Uh, that's why I allocate only five minutes. So basically uh, we have validation for type system in chapter three and it's like demand uniqueness of fields and, and like basically more or less everything like uniqueness of type names or field names but we miss to specify uniqueness of argument names so it's like obvious omission uh, but technically it's like it's still a change it's not an editorial even though it's like obvious so a person opened the PR against uh, repo and I, I think I can like do PR against GraphQL JS and we can like quickly merge it. Uh, I just wanted, you know, because we, we have a procedure for non-editorial change and this is pretty non-controversial editorial change or maybe somebody have like some opposition uh, for allowing duplicated argument names. On the topic of us having a process, um, one of the things that's in that process is making sure that there's a reference implementation before we call it 
final stage? Yeah, I actually wanted to do that, but uh, yeah, like I had some issues with time. Uh, okay. So is idea idea is like at least preliminary ask people maybe like somebody have some opposition and want to voice it. So I think we can move to stage one without uh, without reference implementation and like, at least you know I just want to to start ball rolling. Um, that sounds right. Yeah, I'll just add that label on there now. And the reason why I was asking is I'm just curious if this was one of those cases where we missed something when writing the spec, but we captured it when writing the implementation. No, we actually like in code first schema, when you use in memory object to create it, you use maps. So you automatically have non-duplicated argument names because you cannot. And for SDL validation, I added it only like in 14.0.0 and mm -hmm. I actually forget to add this validation. So right now we're just overriding. So if you specify two arguments uh, with the same name, the second one will silently override the first one. So. Interesting. I'm curious if uh, any of the other implementations do something differently than it, build it with a map. And what we actually, they do with duplicate arguments. We actually have like one edge case. So in fields, arguments is a map, but in directives, it's array. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know the reasoning for, for that. I can guess, but so like technically in directives, you right now you can have duplicated arguments and like, but yeah, so, but it's implementation details. I, I don't think like any have, anyone have objection of actually forbidding duplicated arguments. It's accounts and for it, directives too, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, like uh, I, I didn't check if we spare just mention it in fields or also directives. Uh, I didn't check that. I'm looking at the the pull request. It looks like it does. It's okay. Look, looks like it's doing this for fields, arguments to fields on an object type, arguments to fields on an interface type and arguments on a directive. Hmm. And so, for, for Benji to actually uh, taking time to review it. I think he, he left some review comments and they were was addressed. Excellent. Um, okay. Stage one for sure. And um, Yvonne, I'll, I'll leave it to you for a pull request, unless anybody else um, can volunteer to do that to make sure that there's a code change. I can also tag the couple of people who were involved on this. Maybe somebody can volunteer. We actually have a plan to, to start working on new version of GraphQL.js on new breaking breaking like version to do TypeScript migration. We actually try to do it without uh, making a new version, but it's complicated. Yeah. So right now, I actually want to, to merge as much stuff as possible into current release and switch to a new one because it will take us some time to, to convert to TypeScript and stabilize after that. Uh, have, hopefully there is um, a new maintainer who helps me uh, sp specifically with TypeScript migration. So mm -hmm. it will go fast. That's why I'm actually interested in like fast tracking with and uh, deprecation PRs because it's like two PRs in pipeline that like pretty non-controversial. Awesome.
Just making a note on the PR right now. Awesome. Um, speaking of deprecated directives, Stephen, do you want to discuss that one next? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the deprecated directive is a great tool for evolving your schema, and uh, we use it a lot. Uh, but we we noticed uh, recently that you know, it still isn't applicable to inputs. Uh, so arguments uh, on a field and uh, also fields on input types would be great to be able to deprecate those. And it, it turns out there's a proposal that was initiated in, in 2018 uh, that, that expands the deprecated directive to be applicable to field arguments and also on input object types. And, uh, and so it, it looks like from the discussion that this is, is very close. It doesn't seem to be uh, controversial. Uh, so I, I took the existing PR and just uh, rebased it on master, cleaned it up a little bit so that it is, uh, you know, it looks like it should be mergeable. And just want to see if there's any blockers to moving this to stage two draft status. And and uh, Yvonne might have you might have things to say because I know you've been working with this uh, proposal for for a while also. So and, and uh, so we have linked here. We have the, the initial PR, and then uh, and then I had linked to the revised uh, PR. But uh, Yvonne has has helpfully squashed that back in, so that uh, so that it's all in the original uh, thread of discussion there. And uh, one of the requirements for draft status is that there is a GraphQL JS PR, and so there there is one. Uh, there there are a few. A uh, few things it looks like needs to be done to make that mergeable. Uh, just, I mean, just, yeah, I just updated it. Uh, like, just like when we were talking a couple of minutes ago, I push, uh, <laughs> okay. I replace it and push it. So technically, it's ready. There is like some things, like it's missing some features, uh, which is kind of non essential. For example, we have a, a validation rule. For tracking deprecated usages, and it's need to be implemented, but it's uh, it's like it's not a core functionality. It's like utility function we provide, so it's nice, but it's not required. So technically, PR for adding with with fields is deprecated and deprecated reason to introspection to types to SDL. Uh, extending directives, adding test flow, that everything is like ready right now. And ready to, to be merged. I need to do one more pass to see if I miss something or not, but this look like, uh, it's like 90 something percent ready. Plus I address, Lee, you have some commands in mm -hmm. GraphQL JSPR, I address them. And for, for stage two, uh, you know, unlike stage three, uh, the GraphQL JS PR does not have to be merged yet. It's it's basically just when a proposal has, uh, you know, a set of problems and drawbacks that have been fully considered and accepted or resolve, and the solution is deemed desirable. So, do we do we have consensus that that uh, requirement is satisfied? I think so. Let's just. Um do a quick gut check mm -hmm. and, and all of the other places where we use deprecated they're in output positions. Is that right? This is, this would be a case where we're adding them on an input position. Uh, enums, enums both input and output. Oh, that's a good point. Oh, that's also, is that also new or is that's existing? It's existing. So existing that's is existing. like fields and enum values. Mm -hmm. What we had adding is arguments. I'm just trying to think if there's any case where the the way that the deprecation path works will be any different for yeah, there is, input fields than they would be for regular fields. There is a case that was brought up during discussion. Mm -hmm. it's, um, what if you deprecate non 
uh, non-knowable type. Should you uh, be allowed to deprecate it or not? So it's like, mm. so, but it's for, for me, it's like oh, semantic level. Uh, so like uh, you can mark it as deprecated, but people will need to use it even though because it's like required, it's not knowable. Well, also on an input, it should be valid to remove the bang uh, without that being a breaking change. Whereas that's, you know, it's a breaking change when you're returning a type. But since it's an input, you could just add deprecated and at the same time, you know, make it now knowable without, without breaking. So, right. so we, should do we, we want to go as far as saying that a deprecated field or input type cannot be required? Uh, I think it's like kind of more best practice, I think. Because um, I'm, I'm thinking about the case where like a tool, because um, you have to explicitly ask for deprecated fields in introspection. So some tools that want to operate only on the non-deprecated part of a schema could, you know, request only non-deprecated fields and non-deprecated arguments. And then you're in some front end tool that's doing nice type of heads and client side validation and everything. And it says everything looks great. And then you go to submit that query and the server rejects it because it says you're missing a required argument. Yeah, that would be a really bad state to be in. And yeah. we probably don't want to warn people, even, even warnings, we should be treating as the equivalent of, oh, we could do like a C, like a clang dash w all uh, like prevent you from even using anything that would be a warning. And if that's not possible, then we shouldn't, then it shouldn't even be possible in the language. Like if there's a way that you can end up, I have to use the warning in order to move forward yeah. in a brand new system. And to Stephen's point, the it's a safe, it's a non-breaking change to make a required argument a optional argument, which presumably is what you would, we would do if you were gonna deprecate an argument anyway, because it doesn't make sense to deprecate an argument that's required. Um, yeah. And so it, it, if, if that's the case, then maybe the missing piece here for this single pitfall is just a schema validation rule that just says an argument can't be, a required argument can't be deprecated. Also, um, seems like if we change our mind about this, the spec could evolve forward in a backwards compatible way, right? If we say we want to be able to have deprecation, um, not require the null, we could have that be optional in the future and still have the spec. And I don't, I, I don't think we would want that. I actually think what you guys are saying makes a ton of sense, but it seems like I'm just pointing out that this direction is also seems safe anyway. Um, I just want to throw a counter example in here because <clears throat> uh, we have an internal version of deprecated inputs at Shopify that you know doesn't get surfaced in the spec at all. Um, mm -hmm. But we do have a use case for deprecating required arguments, um, mostly in the form of like because we have a versioned API, we have it's required in version one and then optional in version two and then removed in version three. And we want to mark it as deprecated across the board because that's kind of an informational thing and is not specific to a version. So in the oldest version, it is both required and also deprecated. Would, in that case, would you prefer to deprecate the field and switch to a new field? Because I don't know how you can both, I guess, so you're saying you're marking the input type as, hey, you're going to need to migrate away from this, but right now you have to use it because you're on the deprecated. Uh, you deprecate yeah. everything in that old version? Well, the, so the version, the version itself um, uh, ends support at some point and you fall forward to the next version, which mostly mm -hmm. just works if the schemas are the same. Um, but it's not, it's not possible in that situation. It's not, there is never a possible way to go from one version to the next 
without like either the argument needs to still, the input needs to still be there and exist, but be deprecated in the next one, or you have to manually fix your code. Yeah, I mean, if we're removing an argument, then you have to manually fix your code at some point anyway. It's just a, marking it as deprecated gives a nicer timeline to, to developers that they can be aware oh, of in advance. I see. So what you're saying is that the timeline in which you introduce the deprecated flag is broader than the timeline with which you make that argument optional. So you think yeah. of it as three phases. First you deprecate, then you make it optional, and then you remove it, presumably and, at some point in the future when nobody is using it anymore. Yeah, and we committed it as well to make no, once a version has been released of our API, we make no changes to the schema at all, even the stuff that is compatible, such as making an argument optional. Um, so we can't just like make it optional and then mark it as deprecated. We would have to, you know, go through processes for that. But is is the, you know, I realize that our, our versioning scheme is kind of weird because nobody else versions <laughs> their GraphQL at all. So is this whole idea of, of, of deprecation and nullability a little bit uh, too tightly wound up here? It feels like there's two separate things. One is what can you do with respect to nullability to ensure compatibility while you're making updates to the client? But another dimension to me seems to be that if we look at other languages, they have the ability to mark things as deprecated where it emits a warning versus an error. And I, I wonder if that captures the use case that you're describing, Evan, without changing the nullability of the, the thing. So in other words, like let's say you, know, you have V1, no changes, client and server are very happy. You mark a field as deprecated with a, a, a warning level and you say, hey, you know, just heads up, um, this field will be changed. So if you can get ahead of that, great. And, but that's, that's emitted as a warning and the client can still operate like that. Um, a, a second stage would be, it emits an error, but if it keeps sending the spec, uh, uh, the requests against the existing GraphQL server, according to the existing schema, there will be no errors, it's entirely compatible, except that on the client it's emitted as an error. During, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not expressing myself clearly. In other words, during the tooling phase, let's say, you know, when you're doing GraphQL code generation, it's emitted there as an error, even though legacy clients still sending that query are compatible. That way it decouples the notion of the tooling and the life cycle and the communication of the deprecation from needing to change its nullability. Yeah. I, I'm a little worried we're talking too abstractly about tooling. Like the tools that we have are, we actually know what our tools are. So we should, we should see if this is actually a real pitfall people encounter or if this is something that we're just concerned about. Right, um, maybe, I, cause I wasn't paying attention to the first half of the conversation before I, I just chimed in there. What was the concern that we wanted to make deprecated inputs only for optional inputs? Why, why can't we just deprecate required inputs? Like I'll, re I'll restate my concern. So, um, and, but I'll preface by saying this might, might not be a real concern based on how actual tools work. But imagine a tool, client-side tool, that decides to run an introspection query to learn about a schema without providing the like deprecated true statements in the introspection query to get deprecated fields and arguments and input uh, fields. And therefore, it only gets the non-deprecated pieces of the schema. Then it uses that non-deprecated portion of the schema to do pipe aheads, client-side validation, et cetera. It deems that that client-side code base free of errors. Um, then you deploy that and then you start running these queries only to find that the server rejects them because a argument that that client didn't even know existed because it hadn't fetched deprecated arguments happened to be required. And therefore that, uh, that query was rejected out of hand and didn't execute. So I think that would be a surprising result. Um, but that assumes that tools follow that path where, and so far, the reason why I frame it is like, it's a little bit abstract, but it's kind of the way that the introspection system was originally designed. It should always be safe to say like, I'm a brand new client. I don't care about what's deprecated. I only want to know what is like the new fresh safe piece of the schema to use. Then like that should always be a safe subset to use. And, and concretely, because uh, in this draft, 
we default you know uh, it to false so that you uh, any existing introspecting clients will will then not see these deprecated input fields so graphical any existing graphical out there won't won't receive any any inputs yeah, that that's a great point so when Robert's yeah. talking about um, warnings in traditional other other languages and stuff I think usually when you get a warning you can fix it there's some physical way and in many groups I've been in there's like you know you want to get rid of all your warnings it is a little weird as a like as a programming language concept to have your system tell you warning this is deprecated you know you can stay there for two years but please get off it as soon as you can and today there's no possible way to to get out of it because it's required there's yeah. also yeah. other languages do similar things with like future deprecation or like oh this will be changed in the future this will stop being our supported way of doing it but we don't have the answer yet for how we're going to move yes. off with it and i think that in the in your case evan you could like having another directive like at future deprecated or something like that so just to be clear on what we're doing here like when we mark a when we potentially mark a required input as deprecated, there is a way to move off of it because the version that replaces it that doesn't have that input at all has already been released when that happens. So the way to move off of it is to upgrade the API version that you're using. Right, but it's, it's there's, not, there's not a way without, itself. yeah, there's not a way without that upgrade. Similarly, like if I'm on Python 2.7 and I'm using something and like I'm using something that does not exist or yeah, that doesn't exist anymore in Python 3, but there's no, or is deprecated in Python 3, but there's no corresponding Python 2 version of it in, like, in, of the good stuff from Python 3. I wouldn't want to see, oh yeah, this is, like, warning, you're not supposed to use this, but there's nothing else for you to do until you upgrade. Should a warning be instead of for a client, a warning for the schema creator? Uh, and so then, in, you know, instead of making it a hard validation when you're creating your schema, uh, I, yeah, I don't know that there is a standard schema validator right now, but if there were, uh, you know, an accompanying PR to that, that would say, hey, you're putting deprecated on this non nullable field. You probably don't intend to do that unless you're Shopify. <laughs> yeah, I think my pitch would be um, include this include this rule in the schema, but make it a should rule rather than a must rule. Therefore, ensuring that Shopify's GraphQL server <laughs> continues to be able to call itself GraphQL. Uh, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the arguments that we're just doing it wrong, um, but at the same time, like there's enough of a good business case built up around why we did it this way that I don't think we're going to change it. So. Yeah. 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 Not necessarily doing it wrong. It's just that, you know, graphical is ubiquitous. And so you know, it's worth considering. I don't think it's type to version necessary because what's happening with API, sometimes people actually deprecate arguments uh, and ask you to call another function. What if you try to split one field into two fields and basically like say you cannot use, you don't need a new version to split existing fields into two new, new fields. And basically you say, if you use this like argument, yeah, but in that case, you'll probably duplicate the entire field. Okay, so yeah, scratch it. It's not valid concern. And uh, so, like, uh, to, to move discussion forward, there is like second issue. Uh, person, uh, person, Joel, voice on PR. Um, it's about uh, should we change the logic uh, of include deprecated? because he's worried that old graphical versions, not aware that uh, arguments can be deprecated. Should we like try to address that? Like my personal position is that we constantly add new features, uh, which is not compatible with old 
graphical version, like for example, repeatable directives. So graphical versions don't know that you can repeat certain directives. So if you write them, you get validation error inside the graphical, but not on the server. So I feel like is a similar situation is like if you update your uh, if you update your ipi to use new features of graphql you need to force everybody to update tooling to new versions is it like real concern or not that's i'm that doesn't bother me you know i i'm i'm more worried about backwards compatibility than forwards compatibility we shouldn't make a change such that like every version of graphical should support all old schemas or all old servers, but every version of graphical can't possibly support all new features. Like it can't know what new features will come. And I think that would be too limiting. Um, so for example, repeatable directives, part of the reason why we made the default not repeatable was so that existing tooling would continue to work uh, predictably. And that only once that feature is added to those tools would they uh, recognize those. But you know, I don't know if it would have been the right decision to say we can't do repeatable directives because existing tools don't know about that. And it seems like it's probably the right thing here too with um, leaving include deprecated as false that matches up with how the other things are, are working. From a, from a tooling's point of view, that argument just vanishes. Like it doesn't, there's the concept of a deprecated argument isn't something that a tool knows how to deal with right now. So it would just disappear from the schema. I think that's like the most reasonable thing that you could do in the short term. But it's a good point. Like, I almost feel like there's, um, there's effectively two behaviors for this deprecated. There's there's like actually omitting it from the introspection query so we don't um, clog up new clients with all these fields that they don't care about. But there's also um, the, the tooling aspect where we actually want to, as in the case of Shopify, we want to notify developers, these are the parts of the schema that aren't gonna be supported when you upgrade to the new version, which is uh, obviously a lot of us do GraphQL without versioning. Um, but GraphQL with versioning is perfectly valid as well. And many large providers do version their GraphQL schemas. So there is still definitely value in that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder whether, whether these two things effectively need some kind of uh, separating or whether there needs to be a softer rule on it. So um, as, as Ivan says, like uh, potentially like for input arguments, if they are required and they're marked as deprecated, we include them even when include deprecated in introspection is false. Just include them anyway, because they still exist and are, you know, are required. They need to be there. You can't skip them. So just tweak how that argument would work. And keep in mind that, of course, uh, we don't have um, that argument on the introspection query for input fields anyway, I think. So I think like I actually uh, starting to go on the side of, of forbidding deprecation of non-knowable fields uh, because like I actually want to move this feature forward and if we introduce new concept like a warning or anything new it will stuck with it so I'm I think like let's start from like right now you don't have any way to deprecate arguments. If if initially we took harder approach of like uh, forbidding you to deprecate on noble, uh, people will start using that and we will see how bigger is demand for making non-knowable arguments deprecated. So later we can yep. figure out what to do is it that's kind of what i was saying before i felt like this is something that we could evolve with a small conservative step that limits the applicability and if exactly as i've been saying if the demand is high then we can respond to that 
Yeah, because it's open feature. It's not like we introduce something that people are forced to use, uh, or we change something that they used before. We're giving them new opportunity to express migration paths. Is it like if it's not hundred percent of what they want, at least it will be like ninety something. That's right. Um, I. Sorry, I just I don't understand the the suggestion here. Are we suggesting that we should take this as it is now and move it forward, or should we? Are we suggesting that we should include uh, schemas which Mark argues as deprecated should not must but should ensure that they are not required? So it's tied to this argument. So if if we by default if we meet uh, if by default we meet uh, required arguments, even if they deprecate it, it's mean like it will potentially can break some tooling, as you said, and some existing tooling and maybe some like new tooling if person don't bother to read deprecated stuff. Plus, as you said, like initial idea for included include deprecated was to stay false and to provide quite a free schema. So I like the only thing I I want to voice uh, is that it will be first directive with validation rule because all other directives don't have any specific validation rule. So we kind of open like a new dimension in a sense. We need to to have uh, we need to have uh, validation rules for directives in SDL, which is not necessary bad, but it's something new. And it's not too complicated. It's just like new new like dimension of stuff. Yeah, I I feel like um. Deprecated isn't really like, I mean, it's exposed in SDL as a directive, but it's not really a directive. Um, and similarly, for other directives that make schema changes. So, for example, if you say like, oh, this is a user and then you tag it as at connection and it builds it out as a connection instead, which you could do with a, a transform through a directive whilst constructing a schema. Um, that would then invoke schema validation rules of all those changed things. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I fully understand what you're saying, Ivan. Obviously, you're more familiar with the implementation than me, um, but I don't quite follow. Yeah. So like, uh, maybe yeah, maybe it's like implementation detail. But I try to push as much as possible validation as early as possible. So everything that can can be validated on SDL. I try to do an SDL. Uh, so basically we will have validation rule in IST saying if it's like required view, if it's unknowable and it doesn't have default value. Yeah, by the way, we actually forget that it's not only an unknowable uh, field is required if it's like missing uh, default value. So yeah, I will basically need to check this in IST and check if like, so. Yeah, this is, it's important distinction because it's not about nullability, it's about requiredness, which is a combination of nullability and having a default value. Yeah, but our previous conversation still makes sense. It's just like inspect changes and uh, mm -hmm. reference implementation, we need to be careful. I specifically for that I added the new predicate functions like a year ago is required argument because cool. people was constantly confusing that. I still feel like we need that that rule, otherwise I feel like mm -hmm. it's gonna be too easy for us to create pitfalls, especially since um Steven, your point that defaulting this to false, which means that existing tools will not see deprecated arguments until they include the ability to do so, um, means that this is actually a real problem. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't think we should make it required, 
it should be a should rule, which means actually like the implementation could lag. That that might be okay. Um, but it does seem like a thing that if we spot the case on the schema side, then we should alert. And it, it is somewhat uh, helpful that existing schemas won't have this, uh, you know, since it wasn't possible until now. Yeah. So, so, so existing graphs aren't going to break. You know, totally. It suddenly gets enabled. So like to clarify, uh, we add in this rule into a spec text as should. And mm -hmm. we need to add it as a warning in some shape or form. So like, I'm, I'm worried that I don't know how to implement a warning because we don't have a warnings. Maybe it's, I, uh, I mean, in GraphQLJS, in GraphQLJS, I would just make it a regular schema validation oh. error. Okay. Um, and, you know, because Shopify's, Shopify just like, they have a different implementation, they would just not implement the rule. Okay. Okay, and we will see if somebody actually open an issue about that. Yeah, and we, there are other examples of, of GraphQLJS uh, disabling rules. There's like flags that can be passed in, I know. Um, and so if in the future we find that somebody wants to explicitly disable that, then that might be an avenue that okay. we could explore. Okay. But I think it's better to come out of the gate with something that is the thing that we think is the least foot gun. Okay, uh, in that case, it's it should not be too complicated, yeah. Uh, and I will try to have PR. Uh, yeah, so like, so what stage it's right now? Just to clarify, if if I implement and if somebody helped me or I implemented myself with validation rule, should I merge PR uh, since it's stage two or we need one more <laughs> discussion? I feel super confident about this, especially now that we've talked through this this last potential edge case. Um, I would say that this is totally ready for stage two, noting that there's this like last piece that we want to get onto the spec. Um, and then that way you can, as soon as you get the pro request in a mergeable state, you can go ahead and merge it. Okay, sounds good. Anybody disagree with that? Um, so just to summarize for the notes, uh, we're going to go ahead and merge it, uh, but with the optional validation um, that's optional, but generally enabled, i.e. will be enabled in GraphQL.js, that you cannot have a non, you cannot have a required field, input field that is um, uh, deprecated. Right. So one, I, I do mildly object to the making that a recommendation rather than putting it in the spec itself. Um, it'll go in the spec, but it'll go in the spec as a should rather than a must. Yeah, that's so I, I still feel like that's a little bit weird, especially because clients like as a client side, mostly tool developer, it's very easy to have like a at Facebook deprecated or an at whatever deprecated that I can apply everywhere and by default becomes uh, at deprecated. But in the one weird edge case where I have like, oh, it's a required input, like now my clients. So basically like if my client is using graphical, it doesn't, if they are using the deprecated piece, in the newest version of graphical and graphical decides to hide all deprecations. I've now like made it impossible for my client to interact with my schema. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the, that's the problem. Yeah. Um, and, I think the question is just whether it should be a must or a should. And, you know, Evan already pointed out one case where it's reasonable to not have that rule. And in that scenario that implies that you have, some control over the tooling stack, which Shopify does to a large degree. So I, I would say though, the, the reverse, as uh, Ivan pointed out, the reversibility of that choice 
is much easier if we make it a must rather than a should. If it's a should, we can't, we basically can't ever uh, move it from being a should to a must, whereas mm -hmm. it's much, much easier to go from a must to a should. Right. I, I can today it's it. a must, because today you can't put the deprecation on it at all. I'm happy to take a, an action to like chat with my team and dig into our, into our implementation a little bit and see how, hard, how crazy it would be for us to adapt to a must here. But yeah. that's not something I can answer right now. Okay, I, I don't think we need an answer right now because sounds like the, the next actions are, we're gonna add this as a schema validation rule to JS and therefore it's on the, I'm gonna do it side of the should. Uh, which is what it should be doing for a reference implementation. We can leave this this decision on whether to go for a should or a must. It's literally a one word change. So um, Evan, if we come back next meeting and you've done that analysis and you find out that, oh yeah, actually making that a must is gonna be a hard breaking thing that's gonna cause a ton of problems for Shopify, then that's an example of probably, there, there are probably more than just Shopify that has that kind of pattern and that informs that should is the right thing. And if you think that it's reasonable to adjust from there, then maybe we can keep it as a must. But um, I agree with Matt that it's it's hard to go from a should to a must if we later decide that we really, really want that everywhere. Um, and it's easy to go from a must to a should. So right now we're in the um, Heisenberg uncertainty space between should and must, and we'll resolve it next meeting. <laughs> Sound reasonable. So it, just, it seems to me that if it, I, I think Evan's case is a real important case, but it, I think if it's, I'm not sure it's just a one word should or must. I feel like if it's, uh, if the right thing is a must, then probably the right thing is to, to architect some minor tweak on it so that Evan can still do his case. Like um, the thing Matt said earlier that it's not a deprecated, it's a will be deprecated or so. Mm. I, I don't know what the right way to design that is, but I feel like the, the real right answer might be getting both, you know, not breaking every graphical, but also allowing you to mark something very strongly that it's it's going to be, you know, please eventually stop using it. Future right deprecated. I, yeah. I, I don't have any good proposal for what that is. I'm just saying maybe, like maybe the, the thing that goes along with must is something stronger than just changing the word. I mean, the, that distinction between like, it, that, or rather the, our inability to make that distinction is why we ended up treating deprecated inputs the way we do, uh, which is that like from the way we've been treating deprecated like the real deprecated as well as our fake input deprecations at Shopify, it is purely informational. It is purely like, this is gonna go away at some point. Um, and it can't, it can't be used to communicate anything more than that. And so it's totally fine to communicate that about a field that's required because it's like, that's a, that's a real thing. Um, and now the, because fact that, the fact that introspection queries don't return deprecated fields by default does mean that maybe deprecation was intended to be more semantic than that in the GraphQL spec, but mm -hmm. uh, that didn't, yeah, that didn't get carried through to our understanding of it, unfortunately. The, uh, the original um, expectation there was that if something in your GraphQL schema was deprecated, there should be an immediate action that you can take to resolve it. Um, and the implication there was that your API was not versioned. So you should be able to tweak your query, your client side query in some way um, in order to get around the deprecation. And that that's the reason why it's set up that way. But um, Evan, you mentioned that there's, you already have something in place to communicate deprecation of arguments and, and input fields. Um, presumably that's something that's Shopify specific since this deprecated pieces yeah. in, so we, in we, have a, we have a deprecated flag on our internal schema definition if you put it on a field it turns into the directive if you put mm -hmm. it on a um, an input then it just tag tags something appending it onto the description of that input i see um, and either way it, it triggers some logging on our end so we can see uh, who's using deprecated values so um, that actually brings nicely onto what I was going to mention. Um, so you're doing the the tag onto the description approach, which is I think quite common at the moment in uh, 
because we don't have this ability to add uh, GraphQL extensions uh, to, to types, but that is something that I think has been talked about quite a few times. I believe yeah, metadata. Bands lay in, laid quite a bit of the groundwork for that in GraphQL JS, um, but we still need to yeah, move that forward. And that is something that I, in particular, am particularly interested in as well. Um, what is the, the status of that right now? Do we have a champion for that? I don't think so. I have like um, half finished PR for, for doing two stage introspection. So my personal plan was to do two stage introspection and then to allow us to to have extensions inside introspection types. So, and we need to stage introspection for like other things. And, but basically I'm stuck because we migrate into TypeScript. So that's why I want to flush all the pipeline of proposals with like uh, unique argument name and deprecated stuff. So to focus on TypeScript migration and don't do like two things in parallel, especially experimenting. So I'm kind of have something half, half done. Cool. Um, well, uh, feel free to chat with me about that at any time, Ivan, but I know you've got to, <laughs> you've got to get the other things done before you can move on to that, but it's still definitely something I'm very interested in. And awesome. Uh, um, okay. I think we can move on. I'm going to bump this up to stage two and I'll make a note in the spec pull request about the highlights from the discussion here. So we know how to move forward. Um, but I'm really excited about this. Thank you, Stephen, for injecting a bit of life back into that because I know it had been sitting there for a while without a champion. Um, next, we're going to have a discussion about defer and stream. So Rob, Liliana, I'll hand it to you. Y'all are muted, by the way. Rob, you're muted. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so we, there's just one change that we had talked about since the last time we discussed this, and that was um, the uh, is final property that was going to be on each payload. Uh, it's just a little bit awkward if you we had to say that is final not being present would imply that it was true, which is just kind of a little bit of an awkward condition when you're coding around it. So we flipped it and are just calling it has next. So has next not being there means has next is false. And every payload on a every payload that's part of like a query that has defer a stream will have has next present on it. Uh, so I just updated that in the RFC. Um, and then we uh, have a early first draft of spec edits. Um, it's definitely my first time writing something like this, so it's not expecting it to be anywhere close to ready to be merged, but I think that it'd be good to start getting some early feedback. And um, the GraphQL JS PR is up to date with just about everything that's in there, um, with one exception that I'm still working on, and that's the ability to return async iterators from resolvers. Uh, so we have stream working if you return an array of promises, which is already supported, um, but still finishing that part up. But I think that's about it. That's super exciting. Um, small thing, would you mind splitting your pull request into two, one that hits your RFC stock and then the other one that's against the spec? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, because uh, I'm I'm happy to merge in the RFC improvement has next. Thanks for reframing that. I, I had forgotten exactly the context there, but yeah, this makes a lot of sense. The idea, let me restate it to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. 
if you get a payload and the has next property just straight up doesn't exist, that implies that that server either doesn't know about streaming or just decided not to stream. And you can just assume that that's the final payload, which means all existing payloads are final payloads. Right. Cool. Yeah. And any nice. GraphQL server now that's giving you any kind of payload is, of course, not going to have that property. So you shouldn't expect anything to come after that. Plus, it's kind of cool that in connection spec, in the railway connection spec, that it's people mostly, most of the IP are using for pagination. Uh, they also have a field has next page. So we have a like consistency and it's similar. So it's less confusing and not something, not a new concept. Since like uh, stream is basically also like pagination of some, in some sense. Um, this is great. Rob Liliana, what, what do you all need next? I think it's feedback. <laughs> uh, to Rob's point, yeah, first time we're writing an RFC. So uh, if there's anything missing, I think we'll get the uh, reference implementation in line with the, uh, I guess it's in line with the spec already, but supporting async notables. And then beyond that, um, yeah, just any input to see if we should change anything or if it makes missing. Um, yeah, it would be really helpful. Awesome. Um, well, I'll certainly take a moment outside of this meeting to read through your, your spec edits more carefully and provide some feedback, but um, they look super detailed. So feeling really confident. So awesome. I think it's important to distinguish should we like encourage people to experiment uh, with this like, spec because we have some resources uh, in a way we have like Twitter account and like GraphQL Foundation have a blog and we recently start actually posting on it <laughs> about stuff so if we feel it's in a stage that we're ready to encourage people to start using it as experimental Maybe it worth to use like foundation resource to to like sh show out and say like it's please experiment, please implement. Like do it in a way that if if we change it, it will not break anything uh, production. But like experiment with it. I think like it's a big feature so we need some real experimentation because before we will be sure it's like yeah this is um and it might actually be a good reason to wait on the spec edits and but be proactive about the reference implementation changes because if we can get the reference implementation changes in place and it's great that we've been having these conversations too right so there's um, you all from first dibs, I know the handful of folks on the Facebook team have been contributing as well. Um, it means that we have pretty good confidence that if what we built here is working for folks, then we'll have high confidence that it's the right thing to move forward with from a spec point of view. Um, but if we get it merged into the reference implementation and whether it's, I don't know, you got to pass a flag to turn it on, or you have to add the at experimental when you install from NPM or something like that, just to uh, make sure people know that they're opting into it. Then uh, hopefully we can start to get that experimentation going and see if there's any real world problems that arise. Um, Cause the spec should always kind of lag these experiments that, that are happening. Yeah, that would be great. And the PR it's already behind a flag in there. That's awesome. I think y'all have already kind of published these in the past um, working in progress. Is that right? Yeah, the last thing I published, um, it's still a relay compatible version of stream and defer. Um, so it doesn't have the has next. That's not what's uh, published on that experimental tag. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what we're using right now versus. Cool.
All right. Well, what will come next from me, at least, will be feedback on the spec text. And um, I'll leave it to you all and Yvonne and uh, the folks at Facebook to decide when this pull request is ready to merge. Um, but it looks super comprehensive, so hopefully that's soon. I think it would be great to get to the point where the big bulk of stuff is merged in and most of what we're doing is like iterative improvements. So as we find issues, we're just fixing them in the reference implementation. Just treat it as experimental and it can just kind of iterate in place a bit once we've got it. It looks like it's 90% done, so that's awesome. Cool, anything else we need to cover on deferred stream? Sure. Thanks for the great work, Liliana and Rob. Uh, actually, I have a question about server implementation. So the next uh, question people have after uh, they have a QS feature in GraphQL.js, uh, how we how we can actually use it? Because I, I don't want us to be in the same situation we have with subscriptions when subscription is like, you need to teleport into subscription. So like they exist, but you cannot reach them in any way, shape. Like you, you can through, through a power specification with this de facto standard, but like in, in this case, maybe we need to synchronize it with some way for people to use it on this or like actually use it yeah instead of like creating their own transport protocol so figuring how to how to do that yeah i do have a pr for express graphql that oh, okay. yeah that works with this so and it's actually good timing because we we uh, there is a new contributor who helped me and we like cleaning up the code base. So it's a, it's a right time for us to, to look into it. Yeah. Because we're also thinking about first stable release of Express GraphQL. It's good that I actually miss it. I missed that PR in the list. I need to review it also. Yeah. It's address my question. Ah, and another thing which was also super cool for previous uh, big change interface implementing interfaces is to have like uh, uh, article explaining it to community. So I think like when we merge it into GraphQL.js, we have actually systematic, in GraphQL.js we have systematic problem with documentation. Uh, it's like it's outdated. It's it's not like so. I think uh, temper substitution and actually like a good a company thing would be to have article somewhere like Express GraphQL. We merge GraphQL JS Express GraphQL release both packages and somebody publish a blog post and in release notes we refer to blog post so people know how to use it and what to do and what is the stage of it things like that nice all the more reason for getting this um, merged and enabled with uh, a, a pretty easy to turn on experiment flag um, I noticed that the Express GraphQL change requires you to use the NPM GraphQL experimental version uh, as a death dependency, which is kind of interesting. But I guess that's as close as you can get with the way that it's set up at the moment. But um, this, I, I think this will work out quite well. I'm, I'm looking at that, that pull request, and it looks like exactly what you would hope you would see, Yvonne. So um, you know, one thing that's great is the, the subscriptions spec required like a live connections, web sockets, something like that, a pretty sophisticated backend. This really doesn't, like any existing Express server could should really be able to start opting into defer and stream. Um, so it seems like this is something that we could enable for the majority of existing GraphQL services without a ton of changes since 
HTTP chunked encoding is just not that difficult to enable. Sounds cool. I need to take a look at PR. I'll, uh, I'll add a link in the agenda file um, under one of the bullets in this just so that we don't lose track of it. Um, again, great work, folks. This is um, super exciting. Yeah, this is awesome. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, Rob, is um, since we have the, the GraphQL over HTTP working group, um, we're not yet in a state there to, uh, to merge the, the defer and stream stuff into the, the spec. We've not even got our version one, which is only meant to cover basic queries and mutations, but we are working towards it. Um, it would be great to have the specification of the HTTP network for that um, over, um, over on that project. Yeah, I can I can take a look at um, what what you have over there and see um, if I could write something up to add is there uh, there as well. Nice, awesome. Let's tackle this next agenda item: custom scaler PR for the spec. Um, I know. Andy was not able to make it today. Um, but maybe, Evan, you can talk to this one. Yeah, I think uh, actually we've largely covered this one already. It was mostly a question um, I was talking to Andy and we were both um, not sure what the next step was to get that merged now that the uh, reference implementation is in. Uh, the reference implementation for in GraphQL.js uh, exists now for the scalar URLs, and so the spec should just be mergeable. But I think we covered that when you said you wanted to do do an editorial pass. So, yeah, let me move this to stage three. Um, it's an action item on me just to read over and and make sure I'm not missing anything and perform the merge. But I I have like ninety five percent confidence that what's written here is exactly as will be merged. Yeah, that's fair. We're just curious at this point. Yeah, I'll, one, I'll move the label now. One minor detail I want to raise. Uh, I reviewed today and I'm okay with like everything. Uh, one thing is kind of weird that we, in example, we specify URL and um, uh, UID with uh, RFC links. I, I'm kind of worried that people will read this example as actual thing. Uh, so maybe like, maybe we change it to example com or some like, some, some URL that doesn't look like official because it's, yeah, I understand it's, it's example, but people can decide it's like, they actually specify URL scholar and UEID scholar inside spec. So it's like the single point I wanted to raise. I think we um, we actually discussed this in a previous meeting because originally those examples um, included stuff about time and some other uh, scalers that have a lot more variability. I think URLs are, are widely agreed upon in their formatting, and there's a super clear and pretty old IETF RFC doc that describes them. And uh, that was the reason why we decided to use that one. I think UUID was the other example that was put in here. That one also is like extremely well specified and agreed upon. Um, I can't imagine someone having a UUID type that doesn't use that. I mean, if they, if they do, then they can use a different one because that's how these things work. But you know, I think if somebody copied and pasted the scalar URL specified by the IETF rule, that that would be completely fine. Yeah, but with our decision to have like repo with uh, specs and uh, like, so technically I expect, yeah, like uh, RFC would be the same, but uh, as example with date and time, 
uh, sometimes we need to restrict it more to make mm -hmm. it more compatible or add some clarification or some examples. So basically if it's uh, and probability for for URL and UEID is like it it probably one of top top ten scholars. So at some point if we set up with repo, somebody will add add them in the repo. So we will have like one example through like actual thing would reference graphql.org scours or something. Yeah. And stuff in the spec will reference RFC. So that's why I actually want to change it to example.com UID example.com URL or something, which is obvious, obvious. I understand that like it's a little bit worse in a sense in a sense of illustrating how you should reference with URLs, but it's yeah. less controversial. I, honestly, I think that might be more controversial. I, I don't know, maybe it's not more controversial, but certainly I don't have, personally, at least I don't have a problem with anybody writing their, their schema in this way that points to these IETFs. Um, I see what you mean though, if they just kind of cargo cult the pattern and put in the date time one, and then that's perhaps underspecified. Um, I do want to make sure that these examples are, are real and understandable. So um, they can't, like if they just have the word example all over them, then it's maybe difficult to understand exactly how they should be used. And uh, I, I do think if this uh, centralized scalar website takes off that then we should come back to the spec and, and update our examples to okay. point to, to the point to those instead of IETF documents. Okay. It makes sense. Uh, yeah, it's, it will be a tutorial change. So we don't need to write. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody else share that concern about pointing to IETF docs in these? Uh, this is my lack of familiarity with this particular PR, but is there anything GraphQL specific that we actually need in these specifications, like to do with perhaps uh, serialization or things like that, that might require us to actually uh, reference the, the IETF, for example, but from another document that has a few extra GraphQL specific things? Or is it absolutely fine to just point straight over to the IETF? So I think for completeness sake, you would really like for URL, you'd want a doc that says reference the IETF spec and also serialize it as a string, which is like technically an addition, but I think if we're in practice for a lot of these scalers, like that can almost be implied. Um, and similar to, to Lee's point, like these are examples, we're not, we're not mandating any of this. So I think we can figure it out and do the end editorial change it to the right place at some future date. Yeah. Maybe one thing, cause I think URL, nobody has ever, I, I, I'm fairly certain that the ITF RFC for URLs don't say, here's the string formatting of a URL. Here's the binary formatting for URL. Like URLs are strings. Um, that's just well known. So I don't know that we could add anything for URL. UUID on the other hand does actually like there is some potential ambiguity there maybe because there is like a binary representation of a UUID um, even though GraphQL doesn't have a binary type hopefully it should be obvious on how to interpret that uh, but daytime is a great example where th there is ambiguity and you have to be clear about the serialization rules um, and that requires a wrapping document but I don't know, maybe we could split the difference here and say like, we'll have one example for URL since that one should be pretty non-controversial, but we could have another one that's, you know, something that's, that's more uh, exotic and they specified by can be an example.com slash example slash whatever, just to make it super clear that it's totally fine for you to have scalars that only exist within your domain and that you could ex specify them within your own domain. Yeah, I would actually add like a word like a vendor in URL to show okay. that. You can. Yeah, actually, I like agree with that. It's it will benefit uh, both cases, and it shows that 
it lowers the pressure on our project of standardizing scholars. If people like feel that they, it's normal to use vendor specific stuff, they will be less push about pushing the scholars to be like standard. Mm -hmm. So I think it's actually beneficial in general. Okay. I'm on board with that. I'll cool. pass it on to Andy. Um, I'll go ahead and just make, since that's a pretty minor change and I promised to read over before merging it anyway, since those are non-normative, I'll, I'll just make uh, minor changes as a, a last patch before merging, just to reduce one more cycle around. Uh, this is a good opportunity to also kind of update. We had a meeting a week ago talking about this centralized scalers repo project. Um, I, I hoped that Andy would represent that, but since he wasn't able to make it, I'll give a brief update of, of what that was about. Um, we kind of very, very briefly talked about that last meeting where Andy had put together GraphQL scalers.com or .org uh, and had this question of, you know, what should the future of that thing be? Uh, we decided that that would be a great project to be centrally owned. So the GraphQL Foundation is happy to own that project. Um, but although we'll still, of course, take volunteers to build it out. And we'd love for it to eventually evolve into something that feels kind of similar to how NPM feels for JavaScript packages or any package manager really feels uh, where most of the URLs are, are immutable, but you can kind of point to the latest version of a particular spec. And it has an, a super low barrier to entry for anyone who wants to add a spec. So there's no like approval process um, or, or working group like there is for this one. Uh, but the trade off there is none of the specs, none of the scalar specs there would be official. They would just be a centralized place to track them all. And therefore a centralized place to search over all of them. And I think that's really the value that we would get is if you wanted to say like, hey, is there a spec for date and you find that there's like 13 of them and then you can go pick the one that's most reasonable for you or send a pull request to improve an, an existing one. Uh, I think that could be a really healthy part of the ecosystem of, of scalers. So um, that was cool. Great, great discussion about the pieces that we wanted to build. Um, and we started a new repo for that. And I think Andy has already migrated some of his um, initial prototype into that repo. So some, some progress happening there. If something that's interesting to you, feel free to check out that repo. It's in the, the GraphQL GitHub org. I think it's just called GraphQL dash scalers. Any questions about that meeting or update? Cool. Um, that takes us to the end of the agenda as we have it. Uh, anything else we want to cover before we break today? All right. Um, well, for those of you in the U.S., uh, happy Independence Day and long weekend. Hope you get a chance to go hiking or grill outside or shoot a firework. Um, for the rest of you around the world, thanks for joining late in the day uh, and uh, hope you enjoy your evenings. And for those in Canada, happy Canada Day. That's right. Happy Canada Day. Was that yesterday? That was yesterday. Yep. Yay. All right, everybody. Have a good Bye. one. Y'all, thanks everyone.